everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Hopper. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Irish Cultural Centre's Digital Literary Festival. Uh, the Irish Cultural Centre is based in Hammersmith in London. And for the past 25 years, it's delivered to its patrons the most diverse Irish cultural and educational programme outside of Ireland. The Digital Literary Festival comprises a series of interviews featuring some of the most successful authors in contemporary Irish writing. Uh, they'll be discussing and reading from their recent works. And my interview today is with the author Donal Ryan. Uh, Donal is the author of five novels and a collection of short stories. His first novel, The Spinning Heart, was last for the Booker Prize. He's won several awards for his fiction, including the Guardian First Book Award, the European Union Prize for Literature, and three Irish Book Awards. Donald currently teaches creative writing at the University of Limerick, and his latest novel, Strange Flowers, has just been published. Donald, where, where are you Zooming from today? I am in my house in Castle Troy, in Limerick. In Limerick? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Devon, so we're two countries away. Um, in, in a normal course of events, we'd be having this conversation on stage at the Irish Cultural Centre in Hammersmith, yeah. in front of a live audience. I don't know, do you, would you prefer that? Or did, would you feed off the crowd? Would you enjoy the buzz of it? Yeah, I do like um, live events and I love meeting people, obviously. But I mean, I suppose I can't complain too much because, you know, I'm, I've been fairly unscathed so far by, by the pandemic. So um, yeah. I'm really reluctant to, to give out about anything at all, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to ask. How How is lockdown and the coronavirus been for you? You've, you've thrived? You've survived? It's just been a pain, really. You know, I mean, it's we, we haven't, we've been lucky enough not to have been affected by the virus. Um, yeah. And, but you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's wreaked havoc and it's caused such dev devastation to people um, in, in so many ways. Um, yeah. you know, we switched over to online teaching fairly easily in, in UL with no major trauma. And we finished out with the yeah. And uh, it's been fine, it's been fine. Yeah. Did, so did you get a chance to launch your book or are you going to get a chance? Well, I mean, we, we did an event with Blackwells in Oxford um, online with Kit the Valve, which is lovely. Yeah. The launch event and on, on, on the launch day and, um, that was kind of it, you know. Um, we're actually cocooning as a family at the moment because my wife has to have an operation, so we, I can't leave the house at all at the moment. Yeah, so we yeah. As it normally would be, um, but you know, it's just a, a quiet life. Yeah, and was lockdown a good opportunity to write, or did it give away, give way to other things, other responsibilities? <laughs> I thought I'd, I honestly thought I'd get a, a whole novel written um, in lockdown. <laughs> Everyone's talking about Shakespeare and the bloody Black Death and writing King Lear, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think I think I did a tally the other day. I think I got something like fourteen thousand words done since March. You know, it isn't that bad, but it's not great. It's not great here. Yeah, you're fairly prolific. Yeah, you're teaching creative writing, so you have to teach remotely very quickly. You have to turn turn technical wizard very fast. Yeah, yeah. I moved into my attic of the house here, and um, my wife was disgusted because the attic was just full of junk and open beams, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thought it was kind of moody, that like was looking and, you know, like a, a left bank garret in Paris, but um, <laughs> you know, so we, it prompted us to get the edge converted into a proper room, so we've done that, thank God, so we're in the process at the moment. Um, but, you know, it's, it's different teaching, teaching online, there's a different dynamic, um, and it's, it's hard to kind of gauge the energy of a class, and um, yeah. I think you're, it's easier to lose people, <laughs> you know, you can see yeah. people's sort of heads going on yeah. a little bit sometimes. Uh, I, I had to do it very quickly too, and I found it incredibly yeah. exhausting. You feel very tired by the end of it in ways that are yeah, yeah, yeah. Not enough time for writing after that. Um, so, are you going to go back to real time teaching now in Limerick? Yeah, we're starting back now. So, I think it's going to be um, one week and four. We'll have um, students on, on campus for face to face work. But, um, All right. Be mostly online for the first semester anyway. Yeah, I start this week. It's a bit nerve wracking. I, I'm finding the only thing more anxious than lockdown is ending lockdown. Yeah, yeah, we want to become a little bit institutionalized and kind of set in our ways, I think, in less than Yeah, yeah, very easily. So, Dallas, you, so you're you're in Limerick, you but you're you're from Nina, near Nina and yeah. Tipperary. Tell us a little bit about yourself before we start looking at the new book. Well, um, I'm from yeah. I was born in a small village in North Tipperary called Newtown, um, and when I was about nine, we moved to the nearby town of Nina, which. Um, was probably inordinately traumatic. If you know, it was a four-mile move, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I'm still traumatized. 
Um, so I'm really, you know, I'm a Tipperary man, I'm a real homebird. I don't, um, I don't tend to leave unless I really have to. Uh, <laughs> I'm a bit of a, a coward about travelling. Um, even though I've travelled the world a couple of times now, um, always reluctantly, but always in the process, it's always something enjoyable. Um, but that's really it. I mean, I've got a pretty outwardly, outwardly boring life that I love very much. You know, I'm married to yeah. kids, I'm a teacher you well, and I write books. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's kind of perfect definition of a writer, no? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. When, when did you figure out you were going to be a writer? Uh, well, I mean, I was a kid. It was very early on. It's the only thing I ever really thought I would, I, I would be, you know, the only ambition I ever really had because I am terminally unambitious. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous how little ambition I have in life, you know. <laughs> I, just want, I just want peace, uh, basically, at this. Um, yeah. the, only, the only real ambition I ever had was to be a writer and not even to be a published writer. It was just to actually get something written that I could be proud mm. of. Um, and that yeah. took years and years and years of, of, of time. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I hate to talk about, you know, suffering for art, but I did. But <laughs> for a good few years, while, when everything I wrote just seemed wrong and, you know, forced and just, oh God, embarrassing, really, you know, it took years to yeah. kind of my, my stride. Yeah. yeah. A new story. I mean, that's, I'm sure that's the same story for an awful lot of people. Yeah. And so who were your formative writing influences? Who made you want to be a writer? Who impressed you most? Um, it, it sounds strange because you know I come from a I come from a you know an ordinary background. Um, my parents were working people, um, and we lived in a small house, and we were you know a very happy childhood. But um, my, mm -hmm. my parents tended to buy books in job lots, um, and so our house was completely just wall to wall books. And for some reason, they had um, a real liking for the mid century Americans. And so even at, at a very young age, I was reading you know I was reading Faulkner and Hemingway and um, yeah. Norman Mailer really, like my, my mum's cousin, Tony Sherry, had a collection of Norman Mailer in his house. And my parents had Mailer's books as well. Um, and I was fascinated by him. And especially the book, um, The Executioner's Song. Because uh, I remember yeah. reading at a very young age, and I wasn't reading very long, and I, I, I read a passage where Gary Gilmore is executed. And yeah. he's described yeah. blood and his, and his white trainers. And that, yeah. the image of those blood drops stayed in my mind forever. I'll never forget the feeling. You know, it's really, I felt terrible. I felt yeah. like this. I remember tied up and shot hit in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I can see those influences. I can see it in some of your work, the detail, you know, that kind of really? all thing that says so much. Uh, I see it in Faulkner too, the way you play with, with narrative voice is incredible. It reminded me sometimes of Sound and Fury. Um, you, you started publishing, uh, you, you, you wrote a collection of short stories. So I assume like most writers, most Irish writers, you were tipping away short stories before before you tried a novel. I wasn't really actually, you know. I was. No. Um, I, I think I've got a, a an atypical experience in that respect. That um, I found novels far easier to um, to settle into than short stories. Um, and I'd far mm. more abandoned novels than I had stories in my in my life. I don't I don't know why exactly it is. Yeah. When I wrote short stories, the artifice was all of us screaming at me from the page. Um, it just all of us seemed completely. Um, it just seems. I mean, it just seemed willfully created and, and that seemed like 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 that seemed wrong somehow you know it seemed as though i was yeah. creating house of cards all the time over and over again yeah. and every short story i attempted or finished I either tore up or burnt and i used to burn yeah. them you know i was very i was forensic about it i used to get rid of all evidence of these things <laughs> I used to burn them over to my apartment and my poor father god rest him used to come in and again to my flat when i wasn't there um in number he'd drive in with the express purpose of trying to few things. <laughs> then he knew the <laughs> Good man. Uh, yeah, he ended up with a huge box of stuff. You know, he kept he kept all my so-called juvenilia. He kept all my school essays. Then he kept all the stories I wrote in school that my teacher, Mr. Scattery, and Miss Cattle, you know, talk of grace and wrote me like comments on. And he kept all those and he kept scraps of things from my flat. And then years later accidentally threw them into a skip, you know, just to draw some box out. Yeah. And I remember being at least my archive and dad was just, he was just, I never saw him crying very much, but I saw tears in his eyes, you know, because this terrible thing that happened. I didn't care, to be honest, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, poor man. <laughs> but, uh, so you did publish a collection of, of stories, Slanting of the Sun, which I, I reread recently. Uh, there's a, a, a terrible feeling of despair and loneliness in those stories. I wonder, is that the form itself, the short story form, or were you simply responding to post Celtic Tiger Ireland, or the fact that you're. Was an escape or what? I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I, I, and re weirdly, I was blind to that, and I, I didn't feel that as I wrote the story mm. because I, I thought some of them were quite funny, and I, I, enjoy, mm. I enjoy 
start story writing for a while. And although at one point I gave up completely, and you know, my wife and Marie found me curled up on the kitchen floor crying, saying, "Just ring double day, tell them to get the money back." And I, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I got over it. She said, "Just give up, you idiot, and do it for Christ's sake." Um, and I got there in the end. But yeah, I, I mean, let's, let's, I, I see reviews now of that book, and I look back at places like Goodreads and Amazon, and people saying, "God, these are bleak. These are just full of despair and horror." And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I couldn't see it. I thought they were great. I thought some of them were very upbeat. Um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, what, I, what interests me is that, that your debut novel, The Spinning Heart, I mean, it could have been packaged as a collection of short stories in one way. Hmm. Reminded me of, of Dubliners, you know, each yeah. 21 chapters, you introduce a new narrator, but every chapter is connected by an incident from the previous chapter. So every, I, I love the way you experimented with different narrative voices and each one is kind of passing on the baton in, in a relay race. Um, it's very effective. Tell us about that. Did you intend this from the start or did it just evolve? I did. I, I intended The Spinning Heart to be a short book. Um, I wanted to get it written really quickly um, because yeah. I had just finished writing the thing about December, which was my yeah. first, first novel I ever finished. The first thing I ever wrote that I felt proud of and the first yeah. uh, novel that gave me a real sense of myself as being a writer. Yeah. Um, and if, you know my my sense of being a fraud just evanesced after thinking about December, and I I so wanted to maintain that feeling. Um, I wanted to stay in yeah. that way of thinking about myself for a while. So I said I'll stay going, but I'm not going to get bogged. I'm not going to get bogged down again the way I did mm -hmm. with character, um, because character John Lee just <laughs> I could I could see the darkness there for sure. You know <laughs> he yeah. dragged me down, and I loved him, and I and I mourned him when we, when we parted company. Um, yeah. And I said, okay, I'm going to write a book. And I'm going to write it in polyphonic form, even though I actually hadn't ever heard the word polyphonic at this point in my life. <laughs> yeah. um, because I didn't want to get too involved with any one character. And I wanted to kind of just present a picture of a typical village in Ireland, in rural Ireland. Yeah. You know, at the time, you know, in most rural villages, most of the lads in the village would have gone into trade straight after school, yeah. before they finished school. Um, yeah. Would have been devastated um, yeah. you know, when the, the recession just all of a sudden, pretty much overnight, wiped out all of their employment. Um, and that, that was, you know, and so that, that book I wrote very quickly. I didn't struggle with it at all. Um, I literally had dollar signs in my eyes thinking, this is something I could sell. <laughs> the thing about December was looking unsellable, you know, it was just getting knocked back by absolutely everybody. And it, was, yeah. it wasn't even getting read, it was getting written one page, but no, 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 no way. Um, and you know, I, I, I had an agent even once who sent an email saying, what, what the hell is this? I'd be, I'd be embarrassed to send this to uh, a publisher. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, just don't, don't pull your punches, pal. <laughs> was really aggressive. Yeah, I was really surprised. Um, it's very surprising that somebody would do that, but that's the way it was. And I saw. I read somewhere uh, that uh, the spinning heart was rejected forty-seven times. Is that well, actually, the two books together were rejected, and they, 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 they were the forty-seven actual tangible rejections that I got. Um, you know, if you add in, if you add in all the no replies, I mean, because I, I I actually literally asked every single agent whose details I could find. Um, in Ireland and the UK and loads in America um, and every publisher um, you know, got a copy of the book um, you know, <laughs> and, and time was broke but I spent a fortune instead. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's not a new story. I mean, loads of writers have this story where, you know, the, the, they were must be rejected. I think every writer, to be honest. I mean, you know, unless your commission is to write a book, I think it's going to happen. Yeah. Was no, I mean, it was no real, um, it was no real hardship, you know, it was just, it was just a bit of a slog yeah. So, so when you talk to your creative writing students now, I mean, what's your key advice? Young writers are struggling at that point. They're getting rejections. What do you, what's, what's your basic advice? Just keep going? Absolutely. Well, one piece of advice I give them is to just take their focus off getting published and place their focus on their writing um, and writing as much as possible. And yeah. so, I mean, it sounds like trite advice. And it sounds like very yeah. obvious advice, but I think it's powerful advice. You have to write to your writer. Yeah. That. You know, and you have yeah. to, you have, language has to remain malleable and fluid and warm. It has to remain something you can use over and over again fairly easily as raw material for articulating yeah. something like this. Just tell a story. Yeah. Yeah. And people get, people get so bogged down in trying, you know, in, in, in getting out there and kind of getting published and, you know, having a voice and having an opinion and reviewing books and doing all these other things and having blogs. That's all fine, like, but really, you know, you need to be writing your stories and writing your novels. If you want to be a novelist published, you have to write your novel. It has to be a good novel. It has to be a readable novel in order to be yeah. published. Um, do you, do you, sorry, do you enjoy teaching creative writing now? I and mean, has it changed your own writing for the better, do you think? I've thought about this a lot, actually. You know, and, um, I, I, 
I often think, okay, I wonder what kind of book I'd have written last year if I hadn't been teaching creative writing for the last few years. Would it have been the yeah. exact same book? And it's very, that's very unlikely. Um, hmm. you know, I mean, I think the same thing about, say, like a hurling match. I think to myself, if I wasn't in the stand at this hurling match with these other 40,000 people, would the exact same match happen at the pitch? You know, <laughs> it's like an important question about your, your own importance to the universe. I don't yeah, know. Like a Buddhist I riddle. Yeah, well, I, I think that's why I'm teaching creative writing, and it's because it forces you to really deeply consider the act and the art of writing. And I think that yeah. can only be a good thing when it comes to being a writer. Um, yeah. Because it makes you more yeah. deliberate, I think, and it definitely makes you more aware of, of the craft of writing and what you're doing and how to do it best. Yeah. I, I, I thought the craft in this new novel is absolutely wonderful. I mean, I really could see, it seems to me, I mean, not that much time has passed since your first novel, but I think you seem to have leapt in terms of maturity, as far as I can see, if you don't mind me saying. Um, no, it's actually, I think that, that's nice. Thanks, Keith, yeah. Um, let, let's talk about it. I, I just, I have the proof copy here, um, which I, I devoured in one go, I have to say. Um, I really found it, I wanted to know what happens next. You know, which is, I think, is the basic requirement beyond all the yes, facts. Absolutely, yeah. writing, if we don't want to turn the page, there's no point. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let, let me just read out the, I, I, I don't know if, how responsible you are for the blurb, but just let me read the blurb for people who, who don't know what, what it's about. Uh, this extraordinary story of a family devastated by a sudden disappearance and transformed by a miraculous return. In 1973, 20 year old Mull Gladney takes a morning bus from a rural home and disappears. Bewildered and distraught, Paddy and Kate must confront an unbearable prospect that they will never see their daughter again. Five years later, Mal returns. What and who she brings with her will change the course of her family's life forever. I mean, marketing blur, but you're happy enough with that as a plot description. Yeah, I think actually I'm with Fiona Murphy at, at um, Doubleday who, who wrote that. Um, it's great, actually. Yeah, I, just, <laughs> I, think I, wrote, I wrote a crappy blurb. I can't do blurbs, really. And I can't do the elevator pitch. I can't even describe what my books are about. When I do, people's eyes glaze over because it makes them sound so boring. So I mean, blurb yeah. writing is a great art form. Um, can, can we say more about what and who Mal, Mal brings back with her? Or will that spoil things? I, I know. I mean, I think, it's, I think nearly every review has mentioned Alexander and Josh. She gets married to a man called Alexander, um, who's, you know, a Jamaican background. Um, and they have a son, Josh. Um, and Alexander comes and settles in, in Ireland in a small village where, where Mal was born and reared, which is based on my home village, to be honest. You know, I mean, the landscape, the next to and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. general it's, it's, area. It's, it's, it's a wonderful advice. I mean, I remember growing up in the 70s and, you know, the sight of a black person in Sligo would have made the, the local newspaper, you know, it was, it was such a big deal. Uh, and to see people react, even decent people trying their best, not knowing how to respond. It's it's multi generational. It spans, I guess, what is it? Twenty five years, it must be. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely twenty five. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to do the sums. Um, what I really liked, uh, Donald, it's structured in a series of six sections. Each each section has a, a biblical title. So Genesis, Judges, Exodus, Song of Songs, Wisdom, and then finally Revelation. We, we won't spoil the revelatory ending. Um, it was very striking, very moving. I, I, I didn't clock it, actually. I mean, it's a secret hiding in plain sight all along. It's a wonderful uh, conclusion, but we park that. Um, but the biblical structure, it's very effective, especially the religious faith of the older characters. I love it when we meet Alexander's parents, hmm. a kind of mirror of the two Irish. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, why did you adopt that structure, that kind of biblical structure? Well, I guess it's, it is a religion-soaked book. I mean, you couldn't set um, a book in a farmhouse in North Tiff in the 70s and not have religion as a very, very vivid background, yeah. background actually. Um, because, you know, it, it was a template, you know, the church for the template, a kind of a forced template for, for existence, really. I mean, you know, we, we all, everyone, everyone, you know, beat was, was aligned with the, with the beat of the requirements of, of worship and sacraments. Um, and people like and people like Kit and Paddy would have been observant and prayerful and faithful and fearful mostly. You know, they would they would, they would have been as fearful of, uh, you know, of the neighbours' opinion as it would have been of, of the wrath of God, really. Yeah. Kit especially and has has a lovely a lovely faith. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's almost pagan in, in the fact yeah. that she really she really communes effortlessly with nature yeah. and, and with her surroundings. And you know, and and the spirit of her dead husband is, is something that just 
excuses for her existence. And I think it's a yeah. lovely thing. And I saw I mean, that. Yeah, you're very sympathetic towards that, I think. I mean, and I mean, it struck a chord with me. I mean, they reminded me of my own grandparents very strongly. They came, they came back to me very vividly. Uh, my grandmother's pagan faith, as you said, maybe women of that generation did channel something of the earth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously Catholicism has taken a bit of a battering in recent years. Was this a conscious attempt to readdress that, to say, look, there's another side to it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm a, I call myself a semi-observant and a Catholic, you know, I, I go to Mass yeah. and I get, get great comfort from it um, and you know with my mum from Mass and really enjoy the warmth of it and I, yeah. and I feel completely um, I feel completely entitled to disagree with nearly everything that the church <laughs> says you know and they know yeah. you're know, wrong about that you know I mean I remember feeling really affronted once at Mass because um, and it's the only time I ever ever had a negative experience at, at Celebration of the Eucharist was when um, a solicitor was asked to come to deliver the homily and his homily was about the state that the sanctity of marriage and the legal position in the constitution with regard to marriage and it's the first time i ever left the church feeling really yeah. so i thought what are they doing bringing this thing in to lecture yeah. us what marriage is you know i yeah. mean it has, it has nothing to do with the eucharist or the gospel you get out get out of here with that um yeah but other than that you know i mean I, what i do i still i mean it's, it's, it's my right and it's my privilege to take comfort from the eucharist and from the gospel and it's got nothing to do with anything else um and so yeah. and i love I really love it. I, I, I'll never, ever turn my back on my Christianity, ever. Yeah, ever. yeah. Ever. Um, you know, and it's, it's a lovely thing to have in your life, I think. It really is. Yeah. But then, you know, I mean, it's not just religion. It's fervent belief of, of, of all types causes devastation. You know, absolutely. Yeah. You know, absolutely divine shibboleths cause devastation. Um, you, you can't exist in the world if you're completely trenchant and completely unmovable on any yeah. situation. Yeah. You know, I mean, and there, there are a few inviolable truths that we all have to dear to, like, you know, that, 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 that kindness, obviously, is, 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 a, is, mm -hmm. is um, so important, that no one should ever hurt anybody else. But I think mm -hmm. that's everything that's come around. It, it struck me very much reading it, um, that, I mean, part of the tragedy of the Catholic Church is that they traded power for magic, and you're, you brought some of that magic back, I think, in, in, into it. That was very important. Um, yeah, exactly. Just looking at, at, at the back cover of my proof copy, you got some very, some very striking quotes of admiration from your fellow Irish writers, um, which I'll embarrass you now by reading. Uh, one is from Anne Enright, who says uh, Donald's paragraphs are unnoticeably beautiful. That's a nice phrase. That's very Enright. His heart is always on show, and he writes with a social accuracy that is devastating. And another one from uh, Roddy Doyle, and Roddy says, Donald Ryan, Ryan has given us characters that we haven't seen in Irish literature before. Uh, high praise um, from two, two great writers. But I, I think they're right. I mean, what struck me reading it um, from the start, very strong voice from the start, each sentence seems very beautifully crafted, very carefully weighted in the way, you know, I, I think uh, it reminded me of McGahern and, and William Trevor, actually, that kind of waiting of each sentence. Does it work? Does it add to the next bit? Um, but I, I, what was, I was also struck, even from the opening, that, that there's something very lyrical, but it always supports the content. It is very socially aware of its environment. So I wonder, would you be able to, would you read the opening first? Would you read the opening sure. page or two, the opening section? It might be, especially to get your voice, I think, for that place. Can you read the first page, will I? Read the first page or two. There is a, a complete section, isn't there? Yeah. D down to fill the days. Or fill yeah, the okay. Days. okay yeah. yeah. All the light left Petty Gladney's eyes when his daughter disappeared. All the gladness went from his heart. His days had always been so full of peace. Before Mal went, he pedaled round the parish in the mornings with the post, and he herded and fathered in the afternoons on the farm where he was caretaker. And he walked the fences and checked the gaps and the gates. And his wife, Kit, kept house in their small, tidy cottage. And she did the books for a few local business people. And his daughter, his only child, went to school and learned her lessons. And they knelt every night before bed for the rosary, all three of them. And they had a radio and a dresser and a yard of hens and the green and yielding world around them in every direction. The Ara Mountains behind them and beyond the brow of Tantenna, a shallow valley that dipped across to the Silver Mines Mountains, which stretched away as far as the eye could see that the end of the earth had seemed on a bright day. And the main road and the village below their house at the end of the lane and the Shannon Callows soft and lush below the village and the river running through the callows to the lake 
glinting all of us in the low horizon, no matter what the light. But the world turned cold when Mull went, and what light was, was cast was Dapple's dark with shadow. She left no note behind, just made her bed and packed her few things into her mother's old leather valise and went through the door and across the yard without a sound. And she walked down the lane to the village, and she took the early bus to Nina and the train to Dublin. She'd withdrawn what bit of money she'd had in her post office savings account the week before. That was all they were able to find out. Frankie Welsh, the bus driver, said she seemed happy enough on the short journey in along the Esker line. Quiet, though, like always. She'd said hello to him, getting on. And he'd said he thought it was going to be a fine day, and she'd agreed with him. And that was about it. It was only herself got on the bus in the village, Frankie said, and he'd been surprised to have to stop. He'd nearly driven past her, she was so small. The rest of the passengers that morning were the factory boys from Port Row. She'd sat at the front, just behind his shoulder, well away from the factory boys, but he couldn't see her in his mirror, and he didn't like to be turning around in his seat, he said, and he didn't like to be asking anybody their business. He'd wondered about the valise, all right, and the early hour of her journey, but that was the kind of wondering that a busman kept to himself, the unasked questions that filled his days. Wonderful, wonderful. You perform it well. It's great to hear such that they hear the voice of a of, of a place. Yeah. Uh, I'm not reading this book very much because you know I haven't really had um live readings. Um so it's nice to get to read it actually. Yeah, that, lovely. Um just on the page after that, it's a very compelling opening. You get a real sense of social change beginning to impact on this quiet rural place, mid seventies. Nothing much has changed in a long time you get. And then we get, there's a lovely line, things have gone funny lately, people said over and over. The world was changing fast. Everything was gone to pot. All that new talk and people's hearts and heads being turned and the way they dress now and all the terrible music. It's a very effective uh, and subtle point of view. It's echoing what, what people said over and over. The voice of the, the crowd. Um, was that free, indirect kind of style difficult to do or did it just flow? That first section, actually, I wrote and rewrote three times, and that's that, that when it's published, actually, I wrote fairly, fairly easily. I really struggle. I always struggle with, with beginnings for books. Yeah. So, um, and in the end, the one that feels as though it's writing itself is the one that's normally the best. But the idea of the world changing like that, I mean, and the world encroaching on this small village and this kind of this, this um, rural idyll, is, it was kind of based on, um, on my dad's experience of... of his young days, because you know, because he came from a caretaker's cottage on his side, very, very yeah. like one of his tribe. And um, there were cousins of his neighbours who used to send over packages from America, and, <laughs> and it come but about twice a year, and the whole village would go into a state of excitement when these packages came because yeah. it sent something for nearly everybody, you know, in the house down the road or the boreens. And um, they had a son, um, this couple who sent the packages, and they'd, send, they'd write about the son. Um, every time and his progress and how he got on at school and everybody felt he couldn't know this guy and he was killed in the Korean War and Dad said the day the letter came, a package came full of stuff as usual and the terrible news about this young lad yeah. being killed in the war and he said the whole village mourns this, this, this boy that they'd never met and he felt, he said it really felt as though that war and the world had landed right on their doorstep, you know, and the devastation yeah. and, and they, he, he said he really felt as though the world was a dark, hard place, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Up in this lovely green place, in this lovely kind of, um, you know, in a small cottage, and kind of in happiness, really. I mean, in poverty and happiness. Yeah. You, you, you capture that change very well. I mean, why did, did you set it in, it begins in 1973. Why that particular time, that year? Well, um, mainly because I wanted Joshua to be the same age I was in the 90s, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's based so closely on myself, you know. I mean, yeah. I can talk about my own personality and my own idiotic, you know, passion and my own kind of, um, just my own kind of formative, um, you know, way of seeing the world, you know, and, and yeah. because it's a book about, at its core, it's a book about a boy losing his father. And I wrote the book, you know, the first draft of the book very quickly, just after my father died very suddenly and very tragically. Um, and so yeah. the book itself was almost an expression of grief and a way of reflecting Kind of worst of the shock for a few months. Um, yeah. stage, you know, and it's really that's why I say it's a very personal book, and it's, it's a book that mm. I all also, um, that I feel real gratitude towards and real warmth towards because it's a book yeah. about my father and loving gentleman that he was, and, and it's yeah. a book, in a lot of ways about fatherhood. Yeah, 
I, I mean, that makes sense to me. And we'll come back to Josh because it, it makes sense that it's kind of reversed engineered because there's, when it shifts to Josh in London, it's a, it's, a, it's a big moment. I mean, not that it's unexpected, but uh, you feel like it's starting all over again. There's a whole new, new cycle. Um, we'll come back to that. But one, one thing about the time frame of it I, that I thought was, was wonderful, how the passing of time changes quickly. I mean, you know, you blink your eye and it's gone, but it's quiet. I mean, often time will change in a single sentence. So, f for example, in, in, in the first chapter, in the final paragraph, Paddy and Kate are, are still grieving for, for their missing daughter. And we're simply told, kind of mid-sentence, full five years went past. I mean, that's, a lot of writers would draw attention to that. Um, but what I really liked was within that five-year period, we're given only a few key incidents. So the parents kind of really poignant search for Mal in Dublin, like they're going to find. <laughs> yeah. uh, but also, I thought one thing that really stood out, and I mean, it, it comes back later in the novel, uh, a rather vicious encounter with the son of the big house for whom Paddy works. Uh, that was a, a very shocking moment in what seemed to be almost... A, a lyrical flow. Uh, just a couple of things. Was that use of time the result, again, of serious editing and redrafting, or did you build it in from the start? Um, I, I think that from the start, really, I had the, I had the idea that this book had to move forward um, yeah. in, in, almost in fits and starts, but that these fits and starts shouldn't be disruptive to the reader's experience. Yeah. Um, and I remember the great and in I mean, she's, and she's such, I mean, she's, she's got such yeah. a craft, the craft of writing, and she speaks always so beautifully about the act of writing and about these things. I remember her coming generously to UL once to talk to our students at the MA um, and she was talking about this and she said she often struggled with this, you know, that sometimes she tried to get a character from a seat in their house onto a bus, you know, she'd, she'd end up describing their passage across the room, just next to the door and <laughs> yeah. then leaving the room and closing the door and going on to the footpath and walking onto the bus stop and getting on the bus. <laughs> when you all you have to say is, you know, in the next scene, they are now somewhere else. You know? He's on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> you can do one word. And you know, and I really, I really see it. And I did, I remember for years and years myself, I did it. You know, I, I would try to describe forensically and minutely every single thing that happens, you know. And I mean, that just bores readers. And I mean, it, it'll always yeah. be just knocked off by the editor anyway. And so you, yeah. can do, you can just all of a sudden fast forward five years and say, well, this thing happened. And then five years later, and readers will say, yeah, they'd be grateful for the most part. For that, yeah, yeah, I think it, it works really well. So did you have to? Cut out much for the final draft. I mean, did you have a lot of he walked to the bus? Oh yeah, I mean there was a huge Josh. Josh's adventures are fairly muted. In, in, yeah. in, in, you know, he has a romantic adventure basically, and he's kind of and he's struggling to become a writer, <laughs> you know, and he's struggling yeah. to get a sense of himself and who he is, and also he's struggling terribly with with kind of um, with with um, grief and with delayed grief, the delayed shock, I think. Um, yeah, and uh, but. I lost myself writing this book in this mad adventure that Josh has. Josh becomes a rock star in the, in the very first draft. <laughs> and I really liked it. I loved it. And I really loved it as well. You know, and, and between the two of us, we're going, oh my God, this is, people are going to buy this. Like, we're going to be millionaires. This is just the best thing ever. <laughs> I remember Fiona Murphy and Brian Langan, my publisher and editor, reading it. And there was kind of silence for a while. And uh, you know, for a few weeks, I was thinking, where the email be saying this is the best thing you've ever wrote? Jesus, this is going to be all over the world. So kind of, yeah, oh, yeah, the whole thing with Josh. Um, but you know, and eventually it kind of very gently and very very tactfully, you know, broke to me that <laughs> it was not publishable. You know, it was, yeah. it, was, it, was, it, was it was just for me. It was kind of just for me and Emory really. You know, between us, we concocted this, this, this fantastic story. <laughs> so, he, so he wasn't a rich rock star. He became a poor writer instead. Yeah, and I mean. The, the, all the same things happened, you know, Josh is the exact same person and he gets to the same place and arrives at the same conclusions and all the same people are there and the same things happen. But it's just, I, I, I really think it would have completely alienated my readers and it was so indulgent, mm -hmm. you know, and because you have, I always say to my students, you have to focus, you have to fix part of focus firmly on your, write, on your readers. You know, you have to be generous as a writer and what you write has to be readable. You can't be overindulgent. You know, I mean, you have to indulge yourself a little bit um, when you're creating. But it has to be accessible and readable, you know. It has to yeah. be somebody besides yourself, you know. <laughs> it, was, it was a selfish act, really. Yeah, I, I mean, but again, you know, you've been praised for the fact that you are, there's a social awareness, you know. He's not a rock star. He's coming from a particular place. One of the things I really like, the, the clash we mentioned, it, he 
between the very gentle Paddy, I mean, it is a, a novel in many ways about fathers and sons, and the arrogant son of the big house who has a lousy father. Um, but, you know, Paddy depends on this. Paddy and Kid at the cottage, they're indentured in some ways. Um, I, I found that scene with the arrogant pup of a son very nasty and believable. Uh, you seem very aware of those class inequalities, uh, which is not always, I think, the case in contemporary Irish fiction. Is that something you set out to address from the start? Yeah, and, and absolutely. Because I'm, I'm always, I'm still to this day, I'm 44 years old, you know, and I'm still shocked by the idea of class distinction in Ireland and yeah. how real it is and how stratified the society is. Because I literally grew up in a village that seemed, I mean, in, in some ways, looking back, it's quite, it, in a way, almost like a socialist paradise because there was no, there was no concept of class in this place. And even though looking back now, I can see it. That one of my yeah. friends, his dad owned a factory, and another friend, you know, their parents owned a big farm, and they were my parents' friends. And I didn't realize my dad was a part time farm laborer for most of my childhood, you know. Yeah. I thought my dad was this guy who went to farms to help people out because they needed his expertise and knowledge because he was such a natural farmer. They, they needed him to say when to plant their crops and what to do in a certain field, and you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no idea. Yeah, yeah. And then one day, like in my very late childhood, I saw him being paid by a farmer, and I was thinking, why is she giving dad money? And, and then it hit me really suddenly, really hard. Oh, Jesus, he works for them. You know? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, none of these people, they were all so kind and generous and all such, such decent people. I mean, they'd never give you an idea of difference, you know? I had no idea. I mean, I was blind to it. I mean, I, I wandered into the world like an idiot, you know, in my teenage years. Yeah. I'd been so, I'd been so loved and so protected, you know? And, and, yeah. and, and, and then, you know, all of a sudden, I saw that this thing exists, this thing class exists. Um, yeah. you know, people who literally think they're better than me because yeah. their parents have more money or better jobs than my parents. You know, it's just most, yeah, yeah. It's most amazing and fascinating. I was really fascinated by it. Fascinating. Yeah. You know, it's incredible. And it, it's, to this day, I'm shocked into awareness of these kinds of things um, all the time. You know, that, I mean, that, that really chimed with me. And as part of this, not the setup, but as you say, you know, you, when you're younger, you think it's a halcyon time. Um, on page four, just after the opening scene that you read, there's a lovely description of place after uh, Malta disappears. And I'll just read the quote. I think it's lovely. People climbed lane up from the main road in twos and threes and walked the fields down from Jamestown and Bonacree to sympathise and speculate and reassure. Kindnesses were carried from distant hills and up from the lake shore and laid at their door. It's a lovely, warm vision of community, much warmer than, say, the world of the spinning heart. Uh, so you're recovering that as well as... I do feel, I feel terrible guilt actually about Spinning Heart, about the quote. <laughs> you don't have to. Seriously, no, I do, because, you know, everyone's actually going to, um, I was doing, because for some reason, people think I'm an expert in hurling, not really. <laughs> but, I was going to ask you. I'm a big Tipperary fan, you know, I go to all the matches, but I was asked to do a thing for television for a show called um, Thank God Friday, um, one, about the, the Tipperary Galloway rivalry of the mid to late 80s. And yeah. The 90s, and, um, and so we were going to shoot this in my, in my home village and um, a local publican very kindly had offered to give us space in the front of the pub and, you know, to, to, to accommodate us. But when I got there, he's a really funny guy. He said, oh, you're some bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> he started to name out people from the, um, the Spinning Heart. And then the person he taught that really was in the village, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, oh, no, oh, God, people really think this, you know. Yeah. But I mean, like Spinning Heart really is about people's state of mind and people's self-awareness or lack thereof and people's self-image and how it was terribly affected by, you know, by the sudden penury that was inflicted on us by... Um, yeah. Session. I, I, I think one of the great things about... The, there's a lovely sense of defamiliarization in the book when you see these customs and passwords, especially hurling from an outsider's point of view. Oh, yeah. See a black person looking at hurling. I mean, it really is a Martian coming down and trying to make sense of this. It, it <laughs> must have been great fun. Um, but yeah, but, but that thing too, that's... Um, the intricacy, the complexity of, 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 of a small place. There's a lovely scene at the start when, uh, when Mal returns home after five years, obviously a flurry of interest in, in the community. And there's a lovely scene, there's a minor character, he never appears again, the nosy Jossie, oh, yeah. see horse, and he insinuates himself, I mean, I could visualize this, in, in, into the cottage to get a good look at her. And when he's very gently, quietly, politely shown the door, he says, well, I better be off so, and he laid a little too much emphasis on so, the way no mistake could be made about his feelings. I mean, that's, that's a very Irish thing, isn't it? Like oh, yeah, I can see that. I mean, I think 
I really could see that team playing out. I, I could see Jack Dean in and out of the half door and just, you know, and just absolutely crossing the mother of say for news, you know, for, for a bit of gossip and see what the hell yeah. is back. Jesus, where was she? What happened, you know? And, and then we don't see refusing to give him anything. And him just. And, and, and the fact that the rashers are on in the background, like, I mean. <laughs> It's a real Mexican standoff, you know. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and he walked the extra mile up, the, you know, from the from the main road up to the cottage to see if he'd get news, and he was being turned away, and he was, just, you know, he would have gone away with a face like a slapped arse, basically. <laughs> he was really <laughs> and heartbroken, and and very, very insulted as well, very put out. It's a very nuanced description. Do you do you enjoy writing uh, dialogue or or descriptive prose more? I don't know because I, I try to wind dialogue into the, the description yeah. anyway. Um, I. I I, I don't know, and I know that some readers absolutely hate this, and I've told, people have told me, oh, I, I'm sorry, Lord Donald, but I, I threw your book across the room because you don't use quotation marks. You know, I don't know who's talking at any given time. <laughs> yeah. I remember years ago reading Frank McCourt's uh, memoir, Edge of Ashes, which I absolutely love. It was a really influential book for me, and thinking that's the way I would love if I ever write a novel. I'd love to write dialogue like that. Just yeah. literally wind the dialogue into the sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Not even, and not even marked with a capital or a comma. And I, and I do because my editor insists that it is right. Um, but if I had my way, I would have no distinction at all between a descriptive passage of prose and the beginning of dialogue. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I think that's something that has evolved with, with many. I mean, you know, Joyce got rid of the quotation marks and had the dashes. And I noticed, you know, looking at said Dermot Healy's work over time, he went from quotations to dashes to wending and winding the dialogue in, and it's perfect, you know. Uh, I, I, I think it's a, it's a great sign of things. There's another lovely scene in, in the pub um, when the, the gentle but solid Paddy, Paddy I must admit is my favourite character because he's the spit of my, my lovely grandfather, you know, that kind of, of course, yeah. kind, solid man. But he puts manners on, on a xenophobic local IRA man. Um, that kind of gentle masculine strength, it's very much at the heart of the book. Um, has our understanding of masculinity changed in Ireland over the past few years, do you think? I think so. Um, but I mean, there are still loads of unreconstructed myths. <laughs> <laughs> in loads of ways, I will myself, you know. Um, <laughs> no. But just by nature and nurture, I think. Um, and there are yeah. certain things we all feel we have to do and things, stands we feel we have to take and ways we think we have to be. Because it's just it's kind of a cellular level. It's kind of, it's, it's just, it just exists. Um, but Paddy, you know, in, in some ways, he's an archetype. I mean, he's, and he's, he's very closely modeled to my own father and my yeah. grandparents. And just that kind of solid, stoic, you know, absolutely kind Irish countryman, you know, who yeah. liked you, um, but, but still went in trouble telling you he loved you, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah. That, that, that lovely dichotomy, that lovely duality of nature that we have, you know, um, and that our, our fathers and grand grandparents had. And I, yeah, the idea, I mean, because the idea of taking on the IRA man, you know, and in a way taking on the local IRA, you know, that would just be kind of typical, you know. <laughs> I think every village is a character who is in the official IRA and, and always works, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and, and never and never resigned and, and never joined the pro board either, you know, but still was yeah. man for his whole life. And there were loads of them around. And I love those stories. I love that, 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 that kind of that tradition, once it's non violent, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely thing. Um, yeah, you know, but that kind of man would have really, really crossed. Um, he's the kind of man who Paddy could have been friends with and had a laugh with and had a drink with. But in that situation, Paddy would have gotten his back up and he would have faced down. He'd have faced yeah. down the volunteer army, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that all builds up a great picture, and it again, it sets it up beautifully for that big switch later on, when the focus turns to contemporary London, and we follow the younger character, Josh, so Paddy's grandson, and he's dealing with a, a strange environment in reverse, I suppose. Uh, he, he's very depressed, even suicidal. I mean, that was a motif in, in the early work, wasn't it? In stories and in Spinning Heart. Yeah, um, and yeah, I remember actually and then right finding this out once in a review, which said that I was, I was um, fascinated by the violence men do to other people and to themselves. Um, yeah. And that's, and that's true, you know, that's absolutely true, because it's just there. I mean, there's, there's no point denying it, you know, the, 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 the terrible depression that can descend, you know, almost from nowhere, um, and that, can, that, that affects a preponderance of young men. Um, you know, people in general, of course, not just young men, but, you know, it, it was always very real for me and very present um, and very, yeah. and I suppose at times, very near. Um, 
And yeah. to me, this book, I mean, you know, Josh, Josh was just a younger version of myself at the time, you know. <laughs> yeah, and he yeah, went through yeah. this kind of terrible kind of torment that I was going through. And, you know, it was a kind of a moment at the very end of that section with Josh um, where, you know, where Honey rushes towards him and he's in a certain position, you know. And, you know, I was, that was kind of my own state of being at the time, you know. So, and mm. I'm so lucky to be able to articulate it, to be able to work it out. So yeah. Yeah. So that, scene, that, that, that scene is, is present in every draft of the book um, because mm. it, was, it was a kind of simple thing at the time for me. And I mean, you know, I, I, I love fiction that's uplifting and that it's full of humour and joy where nothing too bad ever happens and you kind of have the idea at all times this is going to end well, this is going to end happily. Yeah. You know, but I, but I, I'm kind of involved and I, I kind of set myself the task of, of, of creating a kind of forensic account of the human condition as I see it. Yeah. And, and but again, you know, I'm not saying that I'm accurate. That, that, that I'm getting this right. It's just this. this. I, I I I thought you were very accurate. There's a wonderful, terrible moment when young Josh feels he's let down his family, and and I'm quoting here the shame he felt for feeling shame. Mm. I I I was gorging myself on this, and I I grabbed my wife, who's a psychotherapist, and I pointed this out, and she said, "All right, that's it. That's pegged it. The shame for feeling shame." <laughs> that's what keeps her in business as a psychotherapist i mean it's a very debilitating thing isn't it in ireland shame culture because it really is yeah and i mean you know instead of going away it's actually it's, it's become more intense and more focused and more acute um because of social do you think so yeah. i mean you see the phrase for shame and shame 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 all the time now as yeah. as portioning blame and 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 telling people they should feel shame for believing a certain thing or not agreeing with a certain opinion and, and shame is bending around again, you know. I mean, we, we were just coming out from under the yoke of shame. Yeah. We just lifted off us and we just, we just pushed to one side. And we then voluntarily took it up again. And we just gave it a different direction and a slightly different nature and decided, okay, I'm, I'm still, people have decided to be arbiters now of shame. And yeah. And apportioners of shame. It's just, it's unbelievable. It's why I stay away from social media as much as I can because of that, just because of that, because of shame. You know, and people apportioning it and telling people how they should feel and how they should think is horrendous. And you would think it's tied into social media, this upsurge in shame. It seems to be, yeah, it seems to be. You know, it seems to be. Yeah. I, whenever I, I kind of, I, I make forays now and again, now and again in there to see what people are saying about me, you know, you know a bit of narcissism. <laughs> 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 you have a good idea. You know, you can be really happy for a while, but oh, it's great, it's great. And you see something, you go, oh, Jesus, you know, somebody's saying something yeah. really hateful and nasty about you, you know, something you've never met, so it's just that hurts us. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I can see, I can really see the positive things about mass communication and about ease of communication and about ease of expression. I can really see the really joyful um, things about Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all those things. But I think people find it a little bit too easy to be vicious on yeah. Twitter, especially. Um, yeah. You know, I think the whole idea of shame, I mean, you know, the, the things we used to feel shame for feeling, now we feel joy about and we feel able to talk about and be open about and to be celebratory. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't know why we decided to go back into this habit again of watching each other um, for, for making the wrong moves and mm. calling each other out and standing on, you know, on, on a high hill of, of, of moral certitude and rectitude yeah. and, and of pointing down to people going, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. It's very awful. It's, it's interesting that Josh is a budding writer, so, you know, we can see there's a kind of self-reflexiveness here. You also get that brilliant uh, device at the end, the story within a story as he's reading out his story to his prospective girlfriend, Honey. Uh, why, why did you take that device? Is, is that drawing attention to the artifice? Yeah, I think it was at, at that point in the book, I was at the point where I was most needing to be oblique about grief. And so I decided I, I decided this allegory um, of grief yeah. was, was going to be acted for that part of the book. Um, and, for, and it fit right in with Josh as a writer. And it fit right in that this was his own articulation of grief. Um, and, it's, yeah. you know, and I, I really, really get comfort from the fact that, that my dad and me and I discussed that story um, before he died. Yeah. Matt, you know, the Gospel of St. Mark was read and that story um, about the blind man being healed and being told, put this place in your eyes, tomorrow you'll see again. Um, and then there's a kind of intimation that he doesn't have a great time after his question by the local Pharisees and stuff. I can't, yeah. I shouldn't look it up now and read it again, but um, I remember dad going to me, do you know what, I said a blind man, I say, there's a lot more to that story, you know. I'd say he must have had a really hard time afterwards. Even if he could be mushing. <laughs> he, he mentioned um, a film we've seen years ago with Pat Filmer about a guy giving his sight back and about his life falling apart afterwards. 
it would be kind of used a little bit of that. But um, yeah. and you know, just the fact that he was involved in some way in the idea of formation for that story, you know, and my early notes for it are extant from the from the time he was alive, and I really love that. Um, and an early yeah. version of the story was around this time. It was part of my formation um, of of the whole novel. Yeah. So thinking back on your teenage self, your little young Josh, what would you have thought if you knew that one day you'd be publishing such highly praised novels? I don't know. Um, I suppose, I mean, from the, from, I remember around 1994, I was 18, I think it was 94 when Roger Doyle won the Booker Prize for um, mm. uh, Petty Clark, ha ha ha. I remember thinking to myself, imagine ringing your parents and telling them that you'd be nominated for the Booker. And then ringing yeah. them again a few months later to say you'd be shortlisted. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. part of the dream can prove me twice. I'm so I'm so grateful for that. But I mean, that was almost just such a remote thing, you know, to ever to finish anything was my first ambition. To finish something that I could be proud of was my first ambition. And literally, when I wrote the thing about December, I, I had achieved that after years and years of trying. Um, it just felt as though, you know, I'd done the thing I kind of promised myself I'd do, and I didn't I didn't feel the attendant shame of failure anymore. You know, no matter how. Yeah which the book ostensibly was failing. It was failing to get published, it was failing to get read, it was failing to be, you know, to do anything. And, you know, I had a lot, a lot of luck. You know, someone pointed out recently on Twitter, actually, that I'm, I'm, I'm lazy and lucky. <laughs> and he's wrong, he was completely wrong about the first part, completely wrong, but about the second part, he was completely right. Um, you know, I, I had such luck. I mean, the fact that Liverpool Press picked up, the, you know, a manuscript of Team Watch Number and read it, and Sarah Davis Goff, you know, and Daniel Caffrey, Anthony Farrell published for me. Um, you know, and then they sold rights to Double Day. I mean, it was just such, I, such, it was such a series of lucky things happened to me. You know, um, yeah, uh, it was great. I mean, you know, I kind of really, really. Um, I mean, I can't, I wouldn't complain at all about anything that's happened to me in the last few years, work-wise and writing-wise. It, it's gone really well. Well, I, I think young Josh will be very proud. Um, we should probably call a halt to it. We've been chatting for an hour. That's that's wonderful, Donald. It's lovely to meet you, even if it's only true. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. It was a lovely interview. Really good. Thank you for taking the time. And uh, I hope uh, to meet you in the cultural centre when this is all over on the other side. It would be great, yeah. And thanks so much, um, people, for listening. And um, I, I really would look forward to coming to the ICC and to meet you guys. It's great. Good. And I, and I should just say, if anyone is interested in buying a copy of Strange Flowers, you'll find a link on it to it on the Irish Cultural Centre website. So. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Donald. Stay well. Thank you, Lash. Bye-bye.